and welcome back to part four of my living life with anxiety and PTSD, my story. I'm Lorraine with Lorraine Marie Fitness, and I'm excited to share this part of the story. I, the first part of the series, I told my, or I told you guys what happened, and then I've kind of gone into some detail about the days following and um, just going to see a counselor, but today we're gonna get back into something a little more juicy, a little more real take you back to um, some of the feelings I had and what it was like to be me during this instant instance. So anyway, today I'm going to be talking about going to court and facing one of my biggest fears. So get ready, brace yourself for a little bit more detail on the actual part of living through what I went through. After the break-in happened, I of course gave my um, description of the man that I saw that you know details that I could remember from looking out my window and looking out over my driveway to see him getting into his car and I gave the officer as much description as I could and the, I guess the benefit of being me is that I'm very observant and I have a good memory when it comes to useless knowledge like what somebody looks like for the three seconds I saw them so anyway, I had done that whenever they took the report and he said the detective that was there said that they would be getting back to me if you know if they had any leads or whatever so about two months go by and I get a phone call as I'm driving home actually and it is the detective saying are you home and I said no but I'm on my way he's like okay well I'm sitting in front of your house I was like okay like why are you at my house and he's like just come home and we'll talk so I I come home and there's an unmarked black car sitting at my house and when I get out they get out as well it was him and some other man and they said, well, we are 99% sure that the guy that got into your house was caught at another house, but in order for us to go forward, you have to be able to ID him. And my heart started pounding, and I'm like, I can't do this. Like, it's been two months. I don't remember what this guy looks like. And just so you know, it doesn't always quite happen like the movies. I didn't have to go to a jail and see these people in real life on the one side, you know, one way mirror. It's not like that. Maybe it is for some things, but definitely not this. So they come to my house and they have eight pictures that are eight by tens of eight different men that could classify as the description I gave them. And I'm like, he's like, I'm going to show you these eight pictures and you take your time, take your time, look at them, go through them and, you know, do the best you can. And I said, I'm like, I can't do this. This is two months past. I was like, I don't remember. And he's like, just do the best that you can. You know, we'll, we'll just talk about it once you pick them. So they have the pictures and we're standing in my dining room and he's showing me one by one, flipping the page and putting it behind. And um, he goes through all eight. And in my mind, I had two picked out. And I was like, I have two. Can I look at these two? So we go back through and we pick out the two that I'm looking at. And I was like, it's this guy. And he goes, well, for somebody that didn't think they could do this, most people can't ID someone after two weeks. He's like, you just picked out the person that we thought it was this whole time in less than two minutes, two months after the fact. He's like, okay, from here on, we can move forward because we were pretty sure this is who it was. You just picked him out. Like, we are ready to go. And I'm like, we're ready to go for what? Like, what does this mean? And, you know, it was, of course, like we can start the, the pressing charges, the court, all of that. And of course, this is all new to me. I've never done anything with this. Like, I've never even had a traffic ticket. I don't, Steve did, but I haven't. So, you know, I'm terrified. Like, what does this mean? How long is this going to take? And, you know, I kind of forget the time frame of when we actually made it to court the first time. But I do remember sitting at my house and I get a knock on the door, which again, if you recall, I hate people ringing my doorbell. I hate people coming to my house unannounced because it's terrifying. And back then it was a thousand times worse. So I go to the door and it's a police officer and I am summoned or subpoenaed, I don't know, whatever you call it, to go to court. So here we go. This is starting. So there's a court date set. And of course I'm panicking. I don't want to do this. I, I, I don't know what to expect. I don't, I don't know. I have no desire to go, but of course I know I have to go. So again, I can't even tell you the time frame of this. I, I remember a lot, but I do, I have tried to forget some of it because it's occupying my mind and I don't want it there. So just know that we did go to court for the first time, and I, of course, did not feel confident going by myself, but I have no family here, and we didn't really know anybody to watch our kids, so Steve and Raylan came with me. 
And when you have never been in a courthouse, really, and you have to walk up the giant stairs, and then you have to go through the metal detectors, and you see all the police presence, and you see all these people, and you don't know what they're there for, and, and you're innocent, but you're here dealing with something really scary, it's the most intimidating feeling. Like I, I felt so out of place. I was terrified. I, I didn't know what was going to happen when I went into the courtroom. I didn't know how it worked. I was scared I was going to miss something or do something wrong. And, you know, there was just a lot of anxiety and fear just with that portion, let alone what happened in a little bit. So Raylan, you can't take kids into the courtroom, so Raylan couldn't go in with us. So what happened is I waited outside for as long as I could, and then Steve stayed with Raylan. So I had to walk into this courtroom by myself with no support. Not that I didn't have it there, but I had no one to hold my hand. I had no one to sit beside me and wait my turn. And guys, I had to take like the deepest breath as I'm shaking and literally sick. Like just, I just wanted to throw up because I was so nervous. And I push open the door and I go in and I go, oh my God, I can't do this. And I look up and there's someone I know. If you know me, I'm not from this area. I didn't have very many friends. And I look up and I saw someone I knew from Steve's job. We were friends with her. And I don't, I, I have a feeling I like basically ran and threw myself into her arms. But I was like, what are you doing here, Ashton? Like, why are you here? What, are, like, what is the purpose of you being here? And somehow, miraculously, and I swear it was God putting her in this courtroom with me so that I had someone. Sorry, just making sure it wasn't my kid had someone with me to be there because he knew Steve couldn't be in there with me. And she just happened to be there for a work thing. There was a petty theft thing and she was there for that. And she, I remember she said, she, you know, she was holding my hand and giving me a hug and like, you know, you can do this. Like you, you can do this. You're going to be brave. You're going to do whatever they tell you to do and you're going to do great. So thank God, literally thank God that there was someone I magically happened to see and know in this courtroom because it was terrifying. I'm sitting there like looking around you know, trying to see if I recognize this person because I knew he was going to be there. And I'm like, okay, where is he? You know, like, I'm just like peeking around the room and she's like, where is he? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what, you know, like I was just so nervous. And they call our, our case, our name. I don't even remember what, how they do it, but I have to stand up and I have to go stand in front of the judge, you know, and I get up and he gets up. And guys, I had to go stand shoulder to shoulder. That's a little bit of an understatement. I'll explain in a minute. But side by side to the man that broke into my home, that stole my things, that has caused me pain, grief, and suffering for however long it had been. And I had to stand beside him like he was equal to me. And in my mind, we were not equals at this point. I was terrified. You know why I was terrified? Because I probably came up to his belly button and he had about 200 pounds on me. And what I wanted to do was hurt the guy. But what he would have done was squashed me because the, the, the significance in the difference in our height and weight. I mean, I felt like an ant compared to this man. And I'm going, he can walk out of here. Like, he can hurt me. He knows who I am now. And I had to stand there and pretend that I was so brave. And inside, I was crumbling. Like, literally getting ready to crash and burn standing right there in the courtroom and I had to stand there and pretend that I was not scared to him because I was not going to let him see me be fearful. So whatever they said, I don't even remember. I was basically paralyzed in fear at that point and I don't even really remember exactly what happened, but I do remember they asked if he wanted a court appointed, appointed attorney or if he wanted his own and he was going to get his own and they reset the court date and I'm like, this is it. Like, this is what I came for. So we walked out and I don't remember. I think he had to wait for someone. I like ran out the door and I got Steve and Raylan, and we kind of were standing off to the side. And when he came out, I was like, Steve, that's who it is. And Steve's like, holy crap, he's a huge man. And, you know, we kind of hung back because I didn't want to walk out with him. I didn't want him to see me anymore. I didn't want him to know, you know, like what kind of car we drove. I didn't want any of that. So we kind of hung back, and we let him leave first. And then we decided to leave. And the courthouse had giant, like a huge giant staircase at the front of it. And I remember we were standing at the top of the staircase getting ready to go down. And he was staring up at us, getting in a car, a really nice car. And he was just glaring at me. And then that fear, it, it was, it was like, I wasn't sure what the look was. Was it like, dang it, you caught me? Was it like, I'm coming back and I'm going to get you? Or, you know, what? But it was a terrible, terrible feeling. 
And then a new wave of fear started. You know, like maybe I had made some progress, but the, this new fear of him coming after me because now he's seen me. He knows what I look like. He knows, of course, what house it was that they're talking about. He knows that I have a baby and a husband. And I just had this huge new fear that he was going to come after me or someone he hired, you know, or was friends with was going to come after us and try to hurt us so that, I don't know, you know, irrational fears here, maybe rational, I don't know. But I was scared that they were going to try to kill us, to hurt us, to ruin us so that he wouldn't get in trouble, even though, of course, he would. But it started this whole new fear inside of me and Steve a little bit. I think that was the first time Steve kind of got the idea of where some of the fear came from because he was a very intimidating man. But anyway, so, you know, that court appearance ended and we got called back to come back another time and I was determined to come back. They said I didn't have to. I could be on phone standby. But I wanted to go. I wanted to show him that I was not going to give up and that I was a strong person. Well, I go and he doesn't come. So they had to reschedule it because he didn't show up. So the third time we went, I, I went again. And I think by this point we had a babysitter, so Steve was able to go with me. And this time when he came in, he was behind the division, like where the courtroom is versus where the, pe the people sit. I forget what it's called. And he was in a jumpsuit, and he was in handcuffs. And that moment of just, <sighs> I can breathe. I felt like, okay, right now he's locked up and he can't get me. And he wasn't locked up from us. It was from something else he did. But to see him in a jumpsuit and behind there and in trouble, it was just such a re rewarding feeling to me. And um, at that point, he did, at, or when they asked him if he had an attorney or if he wanted a court-appointed one, he, he chose the court-appointed one. And again, nothing really happened. Nothing happened at all. I I don't even remember when, if he admitted that he was guilty there or if it was later, but we left again and we had another court date. And really, the, whoever I was talking to said, we don't even want you to come back because this guy's probably not going to show up. Like, you're wasting your time and your money. If we need you, we'll call you. And by the fourth time, I finally decided that I wasn't going to go because it was a good chunk of our day because it was about an hour away, 45 minutes to an hour away. So we didn't go. And after that, that was the last one. And he ended up getting, I think he admitted guilty, and he um, got charged with felony larceny, uh, felony breaking and entering, some other things. Um, I don't remember. I can't even remember. But he was in jail, I think, for three months, and then on probation for, I want to say, 18 months, uh, just for our situation, and clearly he had been trouble, in trouble for other things. And then he was required to pay back the thousand dollar deductible of our insurance because of course insurance paid for everything but we had a thousand dollar deductible so he had to pay that back but we were informed that he only had to pay back money when he was out of jail and working so how long it was going to take to see that thousand dollars was possibly forever um so anyway that was kind of the end of it in terms of the court but i felt I, I felt relief that that was settled, but at the same time, I felt that it wasn't justified because what I felt like was he had a punishment that ended and my punishment for him being dumb never was going to end. I had to live with the anxiety and the PTSD and the traumatic event and the trauma that I had gone through wasn't going to go away in two years time for me. It was going to live on forever and it, you know, you have this emptiness like how is this even fair? How, how is this justice? Because he got punishment but it, but it ends. At least for our case it ended and mine just continues on and it lives on forever and it's something that I will deal with for the rest of my life. But um, besides the actual incident of him breaking into our home, Going to court was probably the next hardest thing, J just in terms of emotions and this feeling of doom, this feeling of not being able to breathe. Um, it was just really hard because the reality was I had a face now. I had a person, and I, I just hated it. And you know what's funny is that there's a part of me that felt bad for the guy. Um, you know, of course I was angry, but... How did you get, like, I, I kept questioning, how did he get to this point in his life? Like, what, 
what had the events that took place in his life, what led to this and why me? And, you know, I started questioning those things and it was really hard. And with time, I, you know, I can almost honestly say that at this point in my life, I've kind of forgiven him. I have learned a lot and we'll talk about that in the next two days, but and there's a part of me that just felt really bad for him, too, because what did he deal with in his younger childhood that led him to where he was today, perpetually getting in trouble? Because when he did it, he was only 19, and obviously this is not the first thing he was in trouble for. He wouldn't have been in jail during the, the court thing. So, you know, it was, it was an event, and if you've ever had to go to court for something besides a traffic ticket or something little and minor, it isn't what you see on TV. It doesn't happen like that. It's, it's drawn out. It's, you feel like it's kind of useless when you go and you wasted your time. Um, and it takes a long time. The process is not quick. It took probably one to two years for us to even get to the guilty verdict, the, the sentencing. Um, I don't know, it was, it was interesting, and I hope I never have to experience it again for any reason. But I just wanted to shed some light into that portion of it, because it played a huge, huge role, and it took a long time, and just didn't end, and it just kind of drug on forever. But I hope that, you know, you got to feel what, maybe experience what that would feel like if you had to go through something like that, or if you know someone that went through, like, something like that, but they've never shared. Hopefully you can understand a little bit. And, you know, if you ever have somebody that does have to go through a court, offer to go with them, offer to be there and be a support to them. Have a group of people that go and just give this person love because you need, you need to be strong in that moment. And you need support. Regardless if they say they do, they need support during this time. But anyway, I hope you guys have enjoyed this so far. I've been, you know, it's been hard to share and easy at the same time. But I, I just hope that I'm helping someone out there, giving you some light into a really dark place in a lot of people's lives. But I hope you come back for tomorrow and the last part of our series in two days and see what else I'm going to be sharing with you guys. But thank you again for your support and your comments and your messages and your love. I hope you guys have a great day and I will talk to you later. Bye.